But let's uh, begin this morning now with our call to worship. And this morning our call to worship comes from the book of Revelation at the end of the Bible, John's great vision um, of the uh, end uh, times of the end of the world and of uh, Christ enthroned and God's people coming to him. And I wanted to read a few verses uh, from Revelation as our call to worship. And the, the first one is, uh, it's, uh, it's from chapter 5, and it says, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seal, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And after this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory. There's this picture of all of heaven's hosts worshiping and praising the Lamb that was slain. And with all that heavenly host is this innumerable, this huge group of people from every tribe and nation worshiping God and praising him, doing what they were created to do, doing what they were redeemed and rescued uh, to do, doing what we are being called to do this morning, to worship God. Let's pray together. Lord, as we gather here this morning, we do so as a as a, a mixed group of people, in many ways a bedraggled group of people. Lord, we come together this morning, each of us with different concerns, different challenges, different troubles, different worries, different things that uh, weigh on our minds. Each of us comes with different hopes, different ambitions, dreams, desires. But Lord, we come to you as one because you have called us to come and worship you. Lord, that you have created us to worship you, to worship you with everything that we are and everything that we have. So Lord, as we gather this morning, we don't forget your goodness to us. We remember that you are the God who forgives You are the God who heals. You are the God who redeems your people. You are the one who births new life in us. You are the one who crowns us with your grace and your mercy. Lord, you are great and holy and you are great in your goodness towards us. Lord, you have not dealt with us as our sins deserve, but rather, Lord, as far as heaven is from the earth or as far as east is from the west, you have uh, separated us from our sins. Lord, that your grace is immeasurable towards those who fear you. So Lord, we ask that you would do that for each and every one of us here, Lord, that if any of us have not yet turned to you, that you would pour your grace into our hearts and lives, that you would free us from Um, our sin from the bondage uh, that it is to us and also Lord that you would set us apart for you Lord that we would be able uh, to rejoice and delight in you because Lord we remember that you are the one that takes pity on your children Lord that you did not spare your own son but rather that you sent him to deliver us to rescue us to redeem us that we would be able to worship you, that we would be able to be part of that great number that will one day gather before your throne and join with all of heaven's choirs to sing your praise and to delight in you. So Lord, help us today to speak and to sing and to live out 
uh, lives that reflect your goodness to us. And Lord, we know that this is going to take so much more than just outward efforts on our part. Lord, that we need you to cleanse us from within, from the secret parts of our heart. Lord, that you would free us of all sin. So Lord, we ask that uh, as we come to you this morning, as we come to your word, that you would show us our own hearts. And Lord, that you would show us how much uh, you have done for us and how you love us and how that is shown to us in Christ. And Lord, as we gather here this morning in comfort and in warmth, in security, we realize that just now around the world and even across the UK, there are people who are struggling this morning, people who are grieving, people who have uh, been lost. And uh, uh, there are family members and uh, those who work for the rescue services striving to uh, find them or to look after them. And Lord, we pray that um, you would be with them and comfort them. And Lord, that this morning there are brothers and sisters in Christ who even right now are suffering because of their faith in you, that are imprisoned or facing conflict or abuse, ill treatment because their faith is in you. So Lord, we pray that now, even in this moment, you would strengthen them and embolden them in Christ. And Lord, that they uh, would shine all the brighter for you in those dark places. And Lord, we pray that you would do the same for us here, that you would uh, just increasingly fill our hearts and our lives and our minds so that we would follow you closer each day and that we would become more and more like you and that we would be the salt and the light in this world that you have called us to be, that you have made us to be. And Lord, that only happens when you are at work in us and when we are obedient to you. So we pray that you would do those things and help us to follow you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, this morning uh, we are going to start uh, just a little mini series for Advent for uh, this Sunday and next Sunday. And uh, this morning we're going to have three different scripture readings, but they're all, uh, the first two anyway, are, are relatively short. And then um, we will uh, just unpack them together. But our first scripture reading is in Matthew's Gospel, and it's just one verse. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. And there um, it says, the book of the, uh, can we have that up on the screen? There we go. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The New Testament opens with this sentence. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And for, uh, the next, uh, for the next two Sundays and then on Christmas Day, I want us to just unpack each of these titles. So this morning, we are going to look at the title, Jesus, the Son of Abraham. And then next week, the Son of David. And then on Christmas morning, we will look at Jesus Christ, the title, Jesus Christ. So this morning, Jesus, the Son of Abraham. And with that in mind, let's now turn to our other two scripture readings. The first one is from uh, Genesis chapter 12 and the first three verses of Genesis chapter 12. And this por portion of scripture marks the first time that uh, it is recorded of God speaking to Abraham. So the first words that are recorded of God speaking to Abraham in scripture. And it says, now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and to your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And then uh, we will f move forward to chapter 22, and here uh, we have the last words that God that are recorded of God speaking 
to Abraham. And let's read uh, chapter 22 together. Genesis chapter 22. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here am I, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mountain of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gates of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they arose and went together to Beersheba and Abraham lived at Beersheba. Now, after these things, it was told Abraham, behold, Milcah also bore children to your brother Nahor, Uz his firstborn, Buz his brother, Kemuel, the father of Aram, Chesed, Hazo, Fildash, Jilda, Laph, and Bethuel. Bethuel fathered Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. Moreover, his concubine, whose name was Reuma, bore Teba, Geham, Tahash, and Maha. Let's pray together. Lord God, you speak through your word. So as we turn to it now, Lord, we pray that you would speak to our hearts. And as I open your word here today, Lord, I pray that uh, you enable me to speak well of your son. And we ask these things in his name and so that you would have the glory and that we would have the joy of knowing you and following you. Amen. All right, well, 
Um, a lot of you, I'm sure, will remember, uh, as I do, when you were a kid or when you watch old films, uh, they very often start off with the credits at the beginning. And it used to frustrate me as a kid. You'd be sitting there and the screen would be scrolling through this list of names and you were just waiting for the story to start. And instead you had to read this list of names. And back in the day, it wasn't that easy to just fast forward over that. You had to just sit there and endure it. And Matthew opens his gospel kind of like that. It's this list of names which, if we're honest, isn't very interesting or gripping for us. And you just have to go to any carol service or any nativity in a school, and they'll skip over that bit and start reading uh, halfway through chapter one, because it's this list of names that's really hard to uh, pronounce, and it seems kind of irrelevant, and we wonder why on earth the story has to start like that. But what we need to realize is, rather than being this list of irrelevant names, that list is more kind of like the scrolling text at the start of one of the Star Wars films, if you've ever seen them, or if you like to watch old uh, war films or uh, history films or documentaries like that, quite often the film will start with a screen of text that you have to read, and that gives you the context into which the story you are about to hear unfolds. And if we just skip that list and start the story, it's kind of like starting to watch a movie or starting to read a book halfway through. And you'll know what it's like if you're sitting watching a film and then somebody comes into the room and they have so many questions you end up having to pause to bring them up to date with what's happening because they'll be saying, who's that? Why have they said that? What's that that's happening? Why are they doing that? And they've got all these questions. So as we come to Christmas and as we come to once again celebrate the birth of Jesus, I want us to look uh, this week and next, as I was saying, at these Two titles that are given to Jesus. Jesus, the son of Abraham, and Jesus, the son of David. Because as we look at their stories, we're given the context into which Christ came. And the story of his birth then becomes so much more relevant to us today. So I want to just uh, quickly go through the story of Abraham, these two passages that we have looked at together, and I want to highlight eight things to you from there. And don't worry with it being eight points, I will try and go through them quickly. But the first thing that I want you to look at as we ask this question, who is Abraham? Why does he matter? The first thing I, I want you to see is that Abraham was an idol worshiper. The book, uh, the Bible starts, the book of Genesis starts with God creating everything good and it being perfect and beautiful. But as you know, the story um, just goes into a tailspin from chapter 3 onwards, and it spirals down and down until you have the flood, and, and God uh, wipes out the whole of creation apart from just uh, a group of people in the ark and the animals. And even that doesn't uh, work as a reset. You find that sin is still present even in this small handful of eight people. That sin still prevails and then as uh, the uh, population begins to increase again, you have the Tower of Babel and God has to scatter people because their um, hearts and their ambition are so selfish and not towards him. And he scatters people and then right in the middle of that, we are introduced to um, a character, Tera, who is uh, this idol worshipper from Ur, southern Iraq, and his family. And one of his idol-worshipping sons is this guy called Abraham. And uh, we discover that God starts to speak to this guy, not choosing him because he's better than anyone else, not because of any righteousness in him, but God seems to just pick one idol-worshipper out of all the idol-worshippers in the world and start speaking to Abraham. Abraham was an idol-worshipper. But the second thing I want you to see is that uh, Abraham is called by God. Look at uh, chapter 12 and verse 1. And there it says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go, or Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to a land 
that I will show you. That it's God that initiates this conversation. It's God that starts uh, this relationship. And it's pretty simple. Uh, It's one simple instruction that God gives him. God says, go. God calls Abraham to go, but it involves leaving absolutely everything, his country, his kindred, his father's house, and by implication, as he leaves his father's house, he leaves his father's gods behind him. Abraham is this idol worshiper who God, for some unknown reason, picks him out of all the others and speaks to him and tells him to go, to leave what he finds his security in, his hope in, his future in, and to step out, leaving his father's house behind him. But the third thing I want you to notice is that Abraham is promised to by God. Abraham is given this one instruction of go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land. But then look at what God will do. Abraham's given this one thing to do, but in these verses we see God doing five things. God says, to the land that I will show you and I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abraham is given these uh, amazing promises from God. But Abraham must step out in faith. Abraham is told to go and do these things, but God makes these five promises to him, these uh, five blessings that God will do, saying, I will do this. But notice that they are all, I will do this. It's all future blessings that Abraham is promised. And Abraham has to take the bold step of taking God at his word and stepping out and following him. And these promises, notice, aren't just for Abraham individually, but actually for Abraham and his family and all nations around the world. And that these promises are are double-sided, aren't they? There's this promise of blessing, but there's also this promise of curse and of protecting. He said, I'm going to bless you, and you are going to be a blessing to others. And those who bless you will be blessed by me. But those who curse you or dishonor you, I will curse. And what we discover here is this quite alarming thing, which is that when God makes a covenant, when God makes a promise with his people, it affects everybody that has contact with those people. Everyone who interacts with them by implication of interacting with the person that God has spoken to They are affected by what God has said. And when God makes a covenant or a promise to the whole world, it has an impact for all of us. You and I are involved in this conversation, whether we like it or not. That opting out isn't actually an option. That by opting out, you are still engaging with God. And he warns here, I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And as Abraham's story unfolds, we see this lived out even in his own lifetime, but also to his people. That as his people follow him, God blesses them and watches over them and protects them. And as people honor them and and, um, bless them, that they in turn are blessed. But people who oppose God's people or oppose God's plan that is unfolding here come under God's curse. And this is a warning to each and every one of us. But ultimately what God is saying to Abraham here is this promise of salvation that through him all the families of the earth shall be blessed. 
In you, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. This is around 1,800 years before the birth of Christ, almost 4,000 years ago from now. And God speaks to this one idol worshiper and says, through you I am going to bless all the families of the earth. And 4,000 years later, we are talking about Abraham and this conversation that he has, these promises that God has made to him. And then what unfolds, we haven't read it because it's 10 chapters long, but the fourth thing I want you to see is what unfolds is that Abraham is a man who is obedient to God. Chapters 12 to 21, there's these 10 chapters of Abraham waiting on God, waiting on God to fulfill his promises. And in those 10 uh, chapters, Abraham, in many ways, is just like any of us, that there's this mix of of moments where he is uh, following God and seems to be making good decisions, and then other moments of just failure and mistakes that have been made. But throughout that story, there is this continuous faithfulness of God to Abraham and Abraham's obedience to God. And what's remarkable is uh, you'll have noticed the name change as we've been reading. So in the first reading, his name is Abraham, A-B-R-A-N. And that means exalted father which is this probably pretty painful name to have when you are unable to have kids. But his name's Abraham. And then God promises him that he is going to be the father of many nations and that through his family, the whole world is going to be blessed. And he goes for years, for decades, being childless and longing to see this fulfilled. And then in the middle of all of that, God changes his name, not just from exalted Uh, father, but changes it to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. (laughs) Which, depending on your uh, mindset and your disposition, might feel like salt in a wound as he gets his name changed in chapter 17. But as those 10 chapters unfold, we see that God is faithful to his promises and finally Abraham and Sarah have their son Isaac. And God reinforces this promise to him and that that it's through this son that the nations are going to be blessed in chapter 21. Abraham is obedient to God. But the fifth thing I want you to see is that Abraham is tested by God. And we see that in chapter 22 as we read together and in the first 10 verses there. And remember in in chapter 12, the first time God spoke to Abraham, he says, go from here or go from your country. So the, the first thing that God says to him is go. And then the last, one of the last passages that records him, God speaking to Abraham, God's words are the same. And he says to him, go and take your son. And it's the same phrase that's actually used in the original text. So he hears God speaking again, and this time God says once again, go. But this time it seems like God is contradicting himself. God has just told him that it's through Isaac that the nations are going to be blessed. And here he is saying, go and take your son and offer him as a sacrifice. Abraham is in this point of just conflict, of mental conflict. He's clinging on to the promises of God that he's finally seen fulfilled. And he's seen his young son growing up and knowing that God has promised that it's through this boy, through this young man, that the nations are going to be blessed. And God says, I want you to sacrifice him. Abraham can't see the end. He can't figure out what God is doing. And in uh, just this um, frustratingly concise story and narrative, we're not given any um, window into what's going on in Abraham's mind. You can imagine what it would be like if this was being told now. 
we would cut away and there would be this scene of Abraham's mental anguish and him wrestling and struggling with this. But instead, what happens here? It says, he said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountain of which I shall tell you. So, verse 3, Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took his, uh, two of his young men and his son, Isaac, and he goes. God is testing him and he can't see the end from the beginning and he's holding on to what God has promised him. And then he's stepping out in obedience to what God has told him to do and he can't see, he can't figure out how those two things could possibly fit together. But he steps out in obedience. And one of the commentators was saying that the foolishness of God is unexplored wisdom for Abraham. That what God is calling him to do just seems so foolish and counterproductive and wrong. But God has told him to do something. And what we're going to discover is that as Abraham steps out, what, what humanly speaking should just be the breaking point for Abraham, the thing that just undoes him completely. He's been waiting and waiting for this promise to be fulfilled. And then God fulfills it and then says, now give it back to me. And you can imagine just his life falling apart. But instead of this being his breaking point, it actually brings him to the high point of his relationship with God. This becomes the absolute pinnacle of his relationship with God. And what's amazing here is uh, it doesn't really come across in the, in the simplicity or the, the shortness of the story, but Isaac also is this mirror of his father's obedience because Isaac isn't some little three-year-old boy at this point, but he's a man, he's a grown man. It's estimated he's probably between 15 and 30. And Abraham is over 100 <laughs> So anything that is happening here is because Isaac is submitting to his dad. Isaac is able to carry enough wood on his back to make an offering, to burn a whole offering. That's not a little bag of firewood. That's a huge amount of wood. And Isaac carries this up the hill and has this conversation with his dad saying, where is the lamb? And far from being some kind of pagan child sacrifice thing that's going on here, actually what's unfolding, this is in a, in a culture, in a world where um, other people would be sacrificing their kids uh, to their gods. But rather than being like all those other gods, God is distinguishing himself from every other god that would ever be worshipped. He's called Abraham and he's made a promise to Abraham. And Abraham says, I don't know how these things fit, but I know that God is faithful and I know that he is going to provide. And that's the sick thing I want you to see is that um, Abraham is the one for whom God provides. As we saw that question in verse eight that uh, Isaac asks him, he says, um, Behold, we have the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they both went on together. Abraham is obedient even when it hurts and it costs him everything. And in his obedience, God provides for him as we see in verse 11 to 14. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket. And then it goes on to say, the Lord will provide and on the mountain of the Lord it shall be provided. Abraham is this man that as he steps out in obedience to God, God provides everything that he needs. 
And that leads us to the seventh thing I want you to see, which is that through Abraham, uh, Abraham is the man through whom the world is going to be blessed. As he is obedient and as God provides this offering, the angel of the Lord then in verse 15 says to Abraham a second time, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will bless you and I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and the sands of the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gates of their enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the world be blessed. God's reiterating and reinforcing this promise that he's made to Abraham, and that through him the whole world is going to be blessed. But the story kind of ends on a, on a weird note, doesn't it? Because it says all that, and then in verse 19, we see them going home. And then the chapter ends with this strange list of Abraham's brother's kids. You kind of think, why do we have this random, you know, he comes down, he's had this act of obedience on the mountain, and he's offered his son up to God, and God says, no, I will provide for you, Abraham. And the two of them come down the mountain and they go home, but it's still just one man and his son. And where is this mighty nation that's coming from him? And where is the rescuer of the world coming from? This man and his son together. And then he gets the news, oh, your brother, by the way, your brother's got 12 sons. And Abraham again is having to stand in faith and trusting in God. Trusting in God and the promises that God has made to him. And you can see that uh, demonstrated for us in the Hebrews where it talks of his faith. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob as heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has a foundation whose designer and builder is God. Therefore from one man and him as good as dead was born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand on the seashore. And by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, He did receive him back. Abraham is given this promise that through him, the world is going to be blessed. But he has to step out and live in faith still. And the final thing that I want to show you is for us to now pan back to Matthew 1.1. And we see that Abraham is the father of the savior of the world. You see, Abraham was instructed by God to come and offer up his only son. And notice the the language that uh, we opened with in, in 22 there, that as God gives him this instruction, it's building up intensity and tension. In verse two, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountain, which I will show you. And friends, you see, Mount Moriah is Mount Zion. It's the same hill. It's the same place. And God leads Abraham to the top of this mountain and says, here, offer your son to me. And as Abraham steps out in obedience, God stops him and says, no, you don't offer your son to me. But actually, I am the one who provides for you. That your salvation isn't 
coming from your sacrifice to me, but your salvation is coming from my sacrifice to you. Because on this same hill, 1800 years later, there will be another son taken, another only son, another beloved son who's going to be offered up on that same hill. But for now, as we come to Christmas and we come to Matthew chapter 1, we find ourselves in Bethlehem and in a manger. And we're told that there is this child born, Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of promise. And this promise that Abraham stepped out in faith in repeatedly and never saw the fulfillment in his own life. But this promise that one day a savior would come in his family for the whole world. And now we come to Matthew 1.1 and see this child being born. And we ask ourselves, could this be the one? Could be this, this be the son that is going to be uh, the one and only son, the beloved son that is going to be offered up on this hill for us. So friends, as we come to Christmas, let us remember what it is we are celebrating and why we remember the birth of Christ. There is a reason why we don't celebrate anyone else's birthday 2,000 years after they were born. But we celebrate Christmas because God gave his one and only son for us so that we could be adopted as his sons and daughters. So I urge you and I plead with you this morning that each of us would be looking to him and trusting in him and calling him our savior as we step out in obedience and follow him. Although we maybe don't see how all the promises fit with that end, to know that he is faithful and good and he is the one who provides for us. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you have done for us. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you sent your Son for us. We thank you that you are the one who calls us to go as you called Abraham. But as you call us to go, you give us the promise to provide for us all that we need. So that as we come to you, We come to you open and empty-handed to be the receivers of your grace and your mercy to us. So Lord, I pray that you would help each of us to be doing that now, that as we uh, leave here today and as we look forward to the, the Christmas season together and with family and friends, that we would, above all things, be looking to you and remembering what you have done for us, that you would be our Savior and that we would be your faithful and obedient children. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with each of us now, today, and forevermore. Amen. Amen.